The first talk is performance, precision, and payloads, adapting on the progress. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Drew Hanover. I'm with the Robotics and Perception Group at University of Zurich. Today, I'm going to talk uh, really quickly about adaptive nonlinear MPC for quad rotor control under uncertainty. Um, so traditionally, any sort of model-based controller requires a, a good model if you want to have adequate control performance. Um, this often requires a large amount of domain expertise. It can be expensive to procure. Um, you can learn you know, residual dynamics, but it requires a lot of data and additional computational effort. Um, and so it kind of begs the question, how do you control a system that you know very little about? So for example, in the top right here, we have a quad rotor flying with an unknown payload of 450 grams. It's completely unbeknownst to the um, nonlinear MPC high level controller model. Or on the right, for example, maybe we take off with a beer payload um, and fly some aggressive trajectories. So it's really difficult to kind of model higher order aerodynamic effects, prop wash, et cetera. And as I mentioned, you can learn these things, but it takes quite a bit of time. So our, our proposed approach was actually to use a nonlinear MPC high level and then design an L1 adaptive controller as the low level to basically learn the residual dynamics online and be able to compensate for any sort of model uncertainty in real time. Um, we don't really want to do any sort of learning we, um, offline. We want to be able to just use sensor information and our known um, understanding of, of a first principles based model. Um, and so our approach is, is extremely computationally efficient. It's less than um, 10 microseconds additional compute time to the nonlinear MPC solution. Um, and so we demonstrate this on a series of real world um, experiments. First, we have increasing speed circle trajectories. Um, we've basically uh, compared these against data-driven MPCs that are augmented with Gaussian processes that learn those residual dynamics offline. Um, and we can show basically a 70% performance improvement in tracking error, um, with, even without an aerodynamic model embedded within the uh, MPC nominal dynamics. Um, next, as we saw earlier uh, on the top plot, uh, we have a 450 gram unknown payload in red. Uh, we have our method, which tracks the two meter per second circle trajectory quite well. It's less than one centimeter RMSE. It's completely unknown to the MPC. Um, and then on the bottom, we have a static external aerodynamic uh, disturbance where you blow a fan basically on the quad rotor uh, to try to introduce disturbance. And again, um, we can track these disturbances quite well. Um, next, we have basically a slung payload of 100 grams, and we fly a relatively aggressive racing trajectory. Um, again, completely unbeknownst to the MPC model, we have to adapt in real time to the time varying disturbance. And we can basically show better tracking performance um, compared to a non adaptive MPC without the payload attached. And then finally, we have a very aggressive racing trajectory. It's about 20 meters per second uh, with over 4G's uh, linear accelerations. Um, and here we can, you know, track these really quite well. And one important thing about all of this work is that the, this controller, uh, throughout all of these experiments, none of the gains are updated at all. The model is never updated, the gains are never updated. So you have a, a very flexible controller that's robust to a bunch of different kinds of model uncertainty. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brendan Englot. I'm an associate professor at Stevens Institute of Technology, uh, not too far from here in New Jersey. And uh, this is work I've done with some of my PhD students. Um, it was led by a former PhD student of mine, John Martin, who is now a postdoc at University of Alberta. We have uh, extracted from the CARLA simulator, which you know, has become a, a very popular high fidelity simulator for RL and automated driving. Uh, we've extracted a stochastic road network from it um, for the purpose of exploring route level learning and decision making. Uh, one particular interest of ours is distributional reinforcement learning and exploring that uh, in terms of decision making at the route level. Uh, so to really ensure that we can learn distributions that are meaningful and accurate, uh, we wanted to start simple and uh, look at the distributions that could be learned with respect to route level planning actions um, on a road network. 
So all of the CARLA roadmaps, we have um, extracted uh, stochastic road networks from them that are customizable and uh, relevant stochastic phenomena that can arise in driving scenarios uh, can be captured in them. We also have um, meaningful simulated perceptual observations that map to each of the locations in the road network. So right now, our rep even though we're working on a simplified road network, our representation of, representation of the state comes from a LIDAR derived occupancy map from those respective locations in the CARLA environment. Here's an example of how we've been able to use this stochastic road network environment for distributional reinforcement learning. This is just a simple situation where we're trying to get from the green dot to the red dot. Uh, currently, we're looking at uh, the actions available to our agent at the blue dot. And we've just dropped one stochastic event into this environment at the location of the magenta dot, which is a crosswalk. And when the agent gets to that location, it may be delayed for some you know, random amount of time based on pedestrians that are passing through the crosswalk. And it has to learn that through experience. Uh, and what we found is, you know, we've used this as a mechanism for evaluating different kind of um, target deployment policies in distributional reinforcement learning. Um, in particular, we're looking at one in which we look at uh, second order stochastic dominance as an action selection criteria uh, to support our decision making. And when we're at that location that's shown there in Cyan, we have two competing actions that have very, very similar expected returns, but one has a much higher variance than the other. Um, and we can explore that using an environment like this, ensure that those distributions that are learned are accurate and the outcomes can meaningfully affect route level decision making and allow us to make better decisions. Um, so here's an example of a case study that we did in this environment, uh, letting our agents explore this environment and exploring different target deployment policies. Um, we have one in particular where we're applying a threshold. And um, if the expected returns fall within that threshold, then we use the variance of the uh, return distributions to make a decision. Um, that's the green plot that's shown um, at right here. And that led us to choose a slightly different path than the path of maximum expected return. Uh, the green path actually skips around the stochastic crosswalk uh, takes a little bit of extra time on average, but a much more deterministic amount of time. So uh, that's just one example of a meaningful distributional RL scenario you can explore in this environment. Uh, we hope others will find this useful. And uh, I encourage you to stop by our poster and check out our code. Thank you. Awesome. Next up, we have uh, Fabio from doing quantifying and using system uncertainty in UAV navigation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fabio. I'm part of uh, CA List. I'm a PhD student. And today, well, I'll present our work quantifying and using system uncertainty in UAV navigation. Well, in our work, we address the task of UAV navigation through a set of gates with a known location, well, these, these red gates. Uh, and basically, the, the idea is to, to Build a neural network that uh, allows the UAV to pass through this set of gates, uh, place it in, in a uh, uh, red, uh, uh, in a circle. And uh, basically, we'll, uh, we want to address the question how uh, does uncertainty from perception impact the control predictions at the output? And how can we improve the UAV navigation performance by just uh, by using the overall system uncertainty? So basically here we propose a method to, to quantify system uncertainty and to and use it to improve the, the navigation performance in this task. So first, our, our architecture is based on uh, composite of, of two components. The first one is the perception, which is based in cross-model variation of the autoencoder. And at inference time, we just use the, the encoder part. And for the control, we just use a simple uh, ensemble of feedforward networks. And uh, to quantify the uncertainty, basically in the side part of the, this slide, the first equation, uh, for the first question, we just use Monte Carlo dropout. And in the second question is basically telling us that uh, we will use the samples that we get at the output of perception, like a, let's say in a mini, mini batch of perception prediction samples, we will pass through each ensemble member this small mini batch of Monte Carlo samples from, from the perception component. So, um, well, the task is to, drive the, the UAV through this set of gates in this circular track. And the yeah. idea is to pass through 32 gates in four laps without colliding or getting off of this track. And uh, the idea is to add random noise to each gate position and height so that we have a more complex uh, track uh, 
for the UAV to drive in. And adding more, uh, adding adding noise to this track basically directly impacts uh, what the UAV sees during during uh, the deployment in the simulation environment. So that we generate, for example, images or these these complex new scenarios generate images or input images that have, for example, two gates in front of it. And um, yeah, but does it work? So in the first stage, what we did is to use the prediction samples, and we follow with the standard approach in the literature that is basically use the control prediction mean, but uh, well, does it work? So, well, not really. In most of the cases, although we just tested in, in a few tracks in these are early experiments, we saw that the UAV couldn't even pass all the, all the gates. It couldn't even pass even the, the first gate. So that made us wonder what was going on. So we just wanted to place uh, uh, some to observe what was going on in the outputs of the prediction component. So we intentionally tried to reproduce what the UV was observing. And we saw that in both at the output of the encoder and the control components, we had multimodal predictions. So basically, uh, well, in the right two plots there are the velocity commands that are predicted. And uh, these are the velocity commands that affect the orientation and the lateral movement of the UV. So uh, we needed to change a little bit the strategy of how we use the uh, prediction component, the control uh, predictions. So we proposed to pick the ensemble member that uh, 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 depending on the on its confidence, and basically we choose the ensemble member that minimizes the mutual information lower volume, lower volume. So basically we're using here we're choosing the ensemble member that has the lowest entropy. And in case we have multimodal prediction, we just choose one mode instead of, of the mean. And does it work well? Actually, it works uh, better than in the previous cases. And uh, yes, this is uh, uh, very interesting so far. And um, yes, so just to conclude, um, sorry, just propagating uncertainty along the system can provide valuable uh, predictions and uncertainty estimates. However, we need to use properly these predictions and uncertainty estimates to properly impact, uh, to positively impact the, the UV performance. And main, one main drawback of our method is that we rely on sampling, which can be uh, prohibitive in some uh, systems that have uh, tight time constraints. Thank you. Okay. Next up is a talk called Swarm Simulation Platform by uh, Tyler, Tyler over here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyler Fadrizi, and on behalf of Professor Shares and Dharam and Tong Yao of Purdue University, I'm going to present to you on the Swarm Simulation Platform. So everyone here building a robotic algorithm, you have about five general steps that you'll go through. First, you're going to have an idea. Then you're going to say, OK, I need to validate it a little bit. Then I'm going to do I'm going to prototype it in simulation, prototype it in reality. And then I'm going to hopefully deploy it, which is kind of what the point of this whole uh, talk's been about. However, let's talk about step three. With one robot, as you guys have seen, it's hard, but it's definitely doable. But what about, excuse me, moth, with 30 agents? Is that possible? How hard is that? If anyone here has tried to do that in Ross, it can be a, quite a nightmare. Now, what happens if you want to do all of that on a laptop because you're a graduate student who doesn't have access to a cluster? What if, like myself, you don't have an entire development lab to help back you? And you wanted to do photorealistic visualizations as well on top of everything that you just heard. So because of this and because of how difficult that can be, we created the Swarm Simulation Platform. Now, this is an easy to use web accessible cloud based system. But when I say web accessible, you only interact through a website. And really, when I say easy to use, the only code you write is the code you actually care about. You don't have to write a communication system. You don't need a perception system if you don't care about it. Now, it's multi-agent optimized. We really thought from the, the start, how can we do swarm robotics? So we built an entire robotic firmware from the ground up that could actually scale to 30 agents and beyond. We utilize scenarios and objectives for benchmarking and community engagement, as well as an open environment. And we have a community space where people can contribute their algorithms in open source. And we can really have discussions about what algorithms work best. We also have a library of available algorithms that you can just use for task allocation, obstacle avoidance, and object detection. But really, the whole point of the system is to reduce the rework, especially on UAV systems. A lot of the times, we're just replicating the work that a lot of other people have done before we can actually get to the algorithms that are really interesting. Now, for benchmarks, this is a critical design aspect when we started working on our system. 
We incorporate state-of-the-art algorithms as our baselines so that you can compare against. But then we also have leaderboards for common tasks. And those common tasks are task allocation, formation control, and rendezvous, some of the, the typical UAV-focused multi-agent scenarios that you might have to do. And then our consistent robotic firmware and computational resources are really what set us apart because everyone uses the same communication system, the same cloud-based computers with NVIDIA GPUs, nothing really changes. And we also have cluster services available so you can scale even beyond just one computer. Now for data collection and analysis for metrics and reproducibility, we have a community-based way of doing this. We actually, we actually elicit from the community what the metric should be for a benchmark. And that's how we decide how you're gonna be graded whenever you go and submit your algorithm for, to get on the actual leaderboard. Now, we also use scenarios in this way, and this is just a defined set of tasks, like take this drone and go search a hospital. For each of these, you also have multiple options for testing your edge cases, such as communication parameters. And because it's, a, it's, it's not a real world system, we have deterministic inference so we can tell you if your perception system is not seeing things correctly. And we also have multiple environments, such as the city, the hospital, mountains, and a lot more. And then you can also customize each of your scenarios that you're using, such as moving randomized humans, and vehicles that you can add into the scene, dynamic objects as well as, and what we're really focused on is adversarial agents, especially, especially in the UAV space as we move forward. Now, future in the future, we're working on automated real world testing gauntlets, right? To help with that SIM to real world gap to, to push your systems as hard as you can in SIM so that you can actually succeed in the real world. We're doing C++ based operating systems with some ROS integration. And we're really focused on reinforcement learning, helping along with you know, OpenAI's gym, all of the common tools everybody uses in RL. But again, adding that so that you only write the algorithm you need and then you just deploy it. To sign up, you can go to SwarmSim.io. Uh, you can create an account and get 100 free simulations. Honestly, right now it's, it's all free because we're still in the testing phase. So use it. Uh, please provide feedback. I have a poster out front. Uh, out front. Please tell me and, and give me feedback because I'm, I'm hungry for it. And I want to know how to make this platform better. Thank you. Awesome. Next, uh, Aliyah. 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 Excuse me. Um, we'll be talking about some sim to real transfer for high speed quad order flight. So, yeah, welcome to my very short talk on sim to real transfer for high speed quad order flights. I'm Ilya Pukav, I'm a PhD student at the Robotics and Perception Group with Professor Skaramitsa. So what I will talk about today is basically learning-based controllers for high-speed flights. So learning-based controllers for high-speed flight are great. We've, we've shown them on several um, applications, basically. And they're typically trained in simulation using some form of imitation learning or reinforcement learning. But then to deploy them on a real-world platform is actually not that simple. So we show that we can transfer such highly agile policies for tasks such as acrobatic flight or high-speed flight in the wild that we can transfer these approaches to the real world using sensory abstractions and the suitable choice of control modality. So let's dive right into this. So, so when I talk about sensory abstractions, I basically mean and we should not go completely end to end. We should not map from RGB images directly to low level control commands. We actually show in our work that an ab abstract form of these inputs actually facilitates simulation to reality transfer. So we can train in simulation on abstract inputs and deploy in the real world on the, on the same abstract inputs and we get successful transfer between domains. Not only about, um, so abstraction is not only about the policy inputs, but it's actually also about the policy outputs. So I presented a paper here at ICRA um, about the control modality that is predicted by these networks. And I show basically that you should not directly go to motor commands if you want to fly agile because it works very well in sim, but in the real world, this doesn't <laughs> really work. And um, if you do velocity commands, for example, um, you transfer very well, but your agility is limited to near hover scenarios. If you really want to fly agile and still successfully transfer between domains, you should go to collective thrust and body rates. That's actually the same control modality that also human pilots use. Yeah, we basically apply these ideas on several tasks such as acrobatics. So what you see here is basically a vision-based quadrotor. So all computation and sensing is done on board that performs 
um, acrobatic trajectories in the real world. What is controlling the drone here is a neural network policy that is trained entirely in simulation and deployed on the real platform without any fine tuning. We also <laughs> deploy these ideas in unknown unstructured environments. So we basically show that we can train a neural network policy that basically maps depth images to receding horizon navigation commands, such that you can fly at very high speeds in previously unknown environments. So we deployed this in forests, snowy mountain trails, or disaster scenarios. And we tested it against the SkyDio drone. Yeah, and the last task that is upcoming that we are currently working on <laughs> is actually a drone racing. So, so what we see here is not Viking based. What we see here is actually a vision based drone that races through the track at the speed that is very competitive to professional human pilot performance. Yeah, if you think this sounds interesting, <laughs> reach out to me. Afterwards at the poster session, write me an email and I'm happy to discuss. Thanks a lot. Okay, Kasum, I think uh, you're up next. And send a real strategy for spatially aware robots, robot navigation in uneven outdoor environments. Hi, everyone. I'm Kasim from University of Maryland College Park. So today I'm going to uh, give a brief uh, talk about our uh, central real strategy for especially wearable navigation in our new environments. So safe robot navigation in uneven outdoor terrains is challenging uh, due to the risk of robot tripovers and high vibrations. So it's important to understand the roughness and the elevation changes of the terrains. Uh, to perform intelligent navigation. So in the past few years, uh, deep brain social learning uh, is hugely successful because of the availability, availability of uh, realistic simulation environments. However, uh, the most of the existing DRL methods suffers from the simple real gap. And we observed that the uh, majority of the existing outdoor uh, navigation techniques are tested and trained only in synthetic or controlled outdoor environments. So in this our work, uh, our objective is to maximize the utilization of a fully trained DRL network uh, to perform uh, comparably better in both simulated and real world environments. So let me summarize our contributions. So in our work, we propose a simple real strategy uh, by extracting an intermediate output from a fully trained DRL network for perception. Uh, instead of using uh, the end-to-end -end actions uh, uh, for navigation, we use uh, an intermediate output for perception. Uh, moreover, we, we incorporate uh, IMU and terrain elevation-based rewards to encode the terrain features into our perception module. Uh, in, in this particular case, terrain features are the, uh, the elevation and roughness of the terrains. Further, we impose a new uh, constraint on the dynamic window approach to penalize the velocities that could cause robot flippers and high vibrations. So this is the overall system architecture. Uh, we use 3D point cloud, robots orientation, and IMU, IMU data to train uh, the attention-based DRL policy. We train this policy end-to-end -end in a unity-based simulator. Uh, however, we do not use the output actions uh, of this network for navigation. Instead, we extract uh, an intermediate result, which we call the uh, attention feature map. Uh, and we observe that this feature map encodes terrain features uh, based on the reward we use to uh, train the policy. Uh, in particular, we use, the, we use dimension, uh, dimension reduced IMU data uh, to quantify the vibration experienced by the robot. Uh, also, the elevation map is used to identify the terrain elevation changes. 
And we observe that the cost map we generate using, uh, using the features extracted from the DRL network uh, highlights critical elevation changes uh, towards the goal direction. So in other words, uh, the navigation cost map attends more to the critical regions towards the goal direction. And we compare our method's performance with the end-to-end -end DRL policy uh, and other state-of-the-art methods. Uh, and we use a clear path Husky robot uh, in the simulation environment as well as uh, in the real world. Uh, we observe comparable performance from uh, both end-to-end -end, uh, and our method in simulation environments. However, there's a significant performance degradation in the end-to-end -end method when it comes to real world. However, uh, we realized that our strategy uh, performs comparably better in both simulation and real world environments. So that is the summary of our proposed method. And thank you very much. Um, so hi, I'm Martin from University of Birmingham. And I, today I present our Burke Toolkit, a set of tools which allows to perform reproducible robot grasping experiments in simulation and the real world. So learning-based uh, grasping methods typically rely on synthetic training data. This includes rendered scene images and grasp annotations from a physical simulation engine. Um, during inference, we instead observe real scenes and execute the grasp in the real world. We therefore have two domain gaps. Firstly, the visual domain gap, which is a difference in the appearance of the image or the point cloud. And secondly, the physical domain gap, which is the difference between grasp executions in the simulation and in the real world. While the visual domain gap is tackled by many works, we instead want to investigate the physical domain gap, uh, which is less frequently addressed. Another issue that we find is uh, the reproducibility of experiments. And when benchmarking different models, it is necessary to evaluate them on exactly the same benchmark scenes for a fair comparison. We therefore need tools to set up scenes for simulation-based and real-world experiments and share them with the community. That is where our Borg Toolkit uh, comes into play. We can create scenes with an intuitive graphical user interface, sample grasps and evaluate them in simulation. We directly export a PDF with uh, indications of the object placements uh, for placement of the real uh, shapes. And using augmented reality, we can further facilitate this placement so that we can execute the exact same grasps in the simulation and in the real world as well. The scene arrangement in this slide is fairly simple. However, we can also set up more complex scenes. For example, with hidden objects, such as the marble under the cup, or with stacked objects. Using both augmented reality and the printouts, we can uh, arrange these uh, reliably. We can also use our setup tools to arrange scenes for deformable objects, although they don't work in our simulation environment. This slide gives an overview of our implementation. We built up on well-established open source tools like Blender, PyBullet, and ROS, and all files can be easily shared with the research community to foster reproducibility of experiments. All our tools are open source and can be accessed under this link. Finally, we did some uh, proof of concept experiments to investigate the physical domain gap that I mentioned earlier. The results confirm this gap and indicate that the simulation is more accurate for scenes with isolated objects, as here on the left, than for more compact scenes, as the one on the right, where objects are almost touching each other. We will further investigate this gap in the future and use the gained knowledge to improve the simulation environment as well. Thank you very much for the attention, and if you're interested, feel free to check out our project page and uh, get in touch with us. And hope you can see my screen. Yeah, let me just close uh, this one window here. Good to go. Hi. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Jay Young Lim from the Autonomous Systems Lab at ETH Zurich. And today I'll present um, Interactive Oasis, which is a photorealistic terrain simulation. Um, this work has done been done with uh, Marcus Mueller and other collaborators at ETH Zurich and uh, DLR. Um, first introduction into OASIS um, is a, uh, a photorealistic simulator to simulate extraterrestrial environments. Um, this is useful since uh, data from extraterrestrial environments are um, 
sparse and rare. Uh, therefore, by generate, synthetically generating scenes, we can get a rich data set, uh, which we can simulate different lighting conditions and different terrains. Um, by using also a synthetic scene generate, as a simulator to generate scenes, we get additional data such as uh, semantic labels um, and instance labels, which would have required expensive annotation processes if we use uh, real world data. Um, while the simulator is created for um, extraterrestrial environments, it can also be used to simulate a more earth like environment, such as forest and waterfronts. And the simulation is uh, easily configurable through a configuration file, which the user can uh, simulate, uh, configure uh, the Blender backend as well as uh, various uh, scene properties um, in the scene. Uh, in this work, uh, we show a, uh, extensions to the existing Oasis simulator, which uh, allows an, an autonomous agent or uh, a, an external planner to request um, interactively uh, scenes uh, to the simulator, which can be useful for um, active perception tasks and um, also active uh, various active uh, methods. Uh, we use uh, gRPC, a remote process control framework for the interface, which supports various language bindings and so that it is general enough um, to serve various use cases. Um, but as an example, to solve uh, to demonstrate a robotics task, we uh, provide uh, we demonstrate a, a ROS based implementation, um, and using the scene gen, uh, scene information, we can simulate various uh, sensor modalities. And this shows a RGBD camera sensor uh, and the corresponding point cloud being simulated uh, with Oasis. Uh, to demonstrate um, how useful this kind of operation of the simulator is, we first demonstrate a, 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 path, a mapping experiments with uh, fixed viewpoints. Um, and you can see uh, uh, the scene uh, being reconstructed in a TSDF based mapping framework Vox blocks uh, from a lawnmower pattern of uh, viewpoints. And to extend it even further, we show a uh, active uh, exploration and mapping task, which is tasked to um, explore and map the environment. In this case, uh, we can see that it can successfully map a, a large hill in the middle of the scene. Uh, the code is all um, open source, and uh, please feel free to approach us uh, if you have any questions or you're interested in using it, uh, we're happy to discuss and give uh, any feedback. Thank you very much. Okay, so you, you should be able to see my screen now, right? Yeah, looks good. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giuseppe Vecchio from the Proceed Lab at the University of Catania. And today I'm presenting Midgod, a simulation platform for autonomous now uh, navigation in a structured environment developed in collaboration with the robotic system group from the University of Catania and the autonomous agent research group from the University of Edinburgh. The main idea behind this simulation platform is to tackle the task of autonomous navigation in outdoor structured environment, which is still a major challenge in robotics uh, because you have to deal with the uh, unstructured nature of environment uh, how cluttered it is with obstacles and with the dangers uh, presented by the environment itself. And uh, it could be applied to many real world applications like planetary exploration, forest inventory, search and rescue, and precision agriculture. In this project, we are tackling, as I said, the task of autonomous navigation, and we are tackling it through uh, as a uh, waypoint navigation task. So we have a fixed goal and map, and uh, from a starting location, uh, we want to reach the goal, avoiding obstacles. Our proposed solution is MidGuard, the simulation platform developed on Unreal Engine, uh, which exploits modern technology to uh, simulate, uh, to obtain uh, realistic imagery and uh, simulate th physics. Uh, it provides diverse training scenes. It actually come up this stage with four with four different uh, training scenes, and it includes a standard interaction interface uh, based on Jim. So it can it is basically plug and play with any current uh, reinforcement uh, learning code. 
Um, as I said, um, we, um, we propose Midgard. It is a realistic simulation platform. It uh, comes with four different navigation scenes. There are meadow scene, forest scene, volcanic scene, and glacier scene. It is highly configurable, and it is meant to improve generalization capabilities in reinforcement learning methods. It, it comes with a procedural landscape generation algorithm, which allows to uh, easily configure and obtain infinite variation of a, a specific scene. And it is controlled by a difficulty level, uh, which allow to uh, control the clutterness of the environment. So to have uh, more sparse or more cluttered and dense obstacles. Uh, it uses a grid uh, representation of the map where for each cell uh, we spawn an obstacle and the size of the cell of the, yeah, of the cell of the grid uh, are used to control the density of obstacles. In the simulator, we model two different kinds of agents, a discrete agent with uh, uh, five actions five uh, discrete actions and a continuous agent. And we also model uh, several different uh, sensor, including RGB camera, depth camera, instance and semantic segmentation. And we also have other low level sensors, uh, including a, a vehicle orientation sensor and a GPS like sensor. And uh, here you can see some navigation example from some trained uh, reinforcement learning algorithms where the green box is the actual target. Thank you, everyone. If you have any question, feel free to contact me and the simulator and documentation will be made available at the project website. Thank you very much.